Well, it's awesome to be here. I'm so thankful to be um, in a room full of women who are inspiring and inspired. Thanks, Charlotte, for organizing this. And our first guest speaker to kick us off. So I'm just going to ask you all to stand up just for a minute and, and kind of say hi to your neighbor, take a breath. So, yeah, just sort of appreciate all the great people that are here. And I'd like you to stay standing just for a minute, because I've got a question for you. So if you're the kind of person who just gets over things that happen, like painful things happen, you know, boyfriends dump you, spouses do whatever, bad bosses poop all over you, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that happens, you just get over it, you know, it might take you a day, rolls off your back the next day, back to life, you just handle it full of ease and grace. If that's you, sit down. And I think there's a few of you, so I want you folks to find me at the break, tell me how you did that. <laughs> the rest of you, I assume you might be like me, that sometimes it might just take you a little bit of time to get over things. Thanks, you can sit down. So the good news, that there's a name for us. We're festerers. <laughs> I'm calling myself a recovering festerer now. But we're festerers. Uh, and you know, when I was telling my husband that name, he said, you're going to say that in front of a group of people? It sounds kind of like, ugh, like boils and pus and stuff. And I said, well, actually, that's kind of what it's like when you can't get over something. It feels like there's some vile stuff trying to get out of you. Um, and you know, a lot of us are like this. I mean, those of you who sat down, you're my role model and I'm going for you, but the vast majority of the population, when I go to coffee shops and I just sort of occasionally listen to conversations, do you know what people are doing? They're not going for coffee. Do you know what people are doing? They're festering. <laughs> They're talking about these bloody co-workers that are making their lives miserable, or the boss who did this, or do that ex that did that. And happy hour, folks. I used to be a bartender. A lot of people come to happy hour. They are not happy. <laughs> not happy. They're miserable. And they're complaining about everything and anything, and they're drinking to numb the pain. It's kind of a common thing, right? It's sort of the human experience to do that. So when I was 36, I did get my PhD. And at that point, I had spent 2 thirds of my life, 24 years in school. 24 years. That's a long time to be in school. And I thought that by that point, my life would be together. That was the kind of, that I'm going for this, I'm going to do it. So for a few hours after they told me I'd passed, I was so relieved because the torture was over and I could actually read a novel again instead of feeling guilty about not working on my school. I kind of felt okay, but truthfully, my life was a bit of a mess. I was at the lowest of the low of the low. I was financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically, just kind of broke. It was like, what, what happened here? What, what, how, how did this happen? Um, I was so close to bankruptcy that I had to have my parents come and co-sign a loan. Now remember, folks, I'm 36 years old and I'm sitting in the bank with my parents co-signing my loan, and my parents are salt-of-the-earth farmers, like farmers. And they're saying to me, you know, I, I didn't really get this university thing that you were doing anyway. And so now you've finished it. And now we are here signing a loan for you. I don't understand that. Why didn't you marry that farmer next door? Like, what's, what's up with that? I couldn't even afford to live in my own place. I was sleeping on an air mattress in my friend's living room. This is a few years ago, so I, but I was the original Airbnb host and guest, <laughs> as it turned out. And I was festering, and I couldn't get over. The, the biggest thing was the boyfriend. I'd just broken up with yet one more boyfriend in the long, long list of sad, sad, sad relationships for my entire life. That's 
that, that was what this university degree got me. Sorry, UBC. I know I'm in the hallowed halls, but that's what it got me. So I did the only thing that one can do in this circumstance, and I, I'm, I'm like Karen, I got a job. Because <laughs> I thought, I don't know what else to do. And I actually couldn't find a job as an academic, like teaching at a university, I couldn't even do that. And that's what I was trained for. So I got this kind of uninspiring job because I had to make some money somewhere. And the woman who hired me said, um, you know, you're way overqualified for this. I, I could be making a big mistake, she said, but I kind of like your honesty about how messed up you are at this point. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. So I spent 24 months, two years, 24 months, how many days is that, 700 and whatever, uh, digging my way out of this financial mess that I had kind of gotten myself into and festering, still festering, still complaining about everything because it wasn't my fault that I was there, it was everybody else's fault that I was there. The academic system is messed up and these bosses that I had had and all of this and this and this and this and this. But you know what I festered about the most? The boyfriend, of course. What is it with exes? Like the exes, they just sort of get in our heads. We just can't let go. It's like a year or two, like decades sometimes later and we're still, if only that ex hadn't dumped me. <laughs> so I did the next sensible thing. <laughs> Bought a motorcycle. Yes. I bought a motorcycle, because you know what I realized in all my festering? I missed the motorcycle more than I missed the boyfriend. <laughs> and I can ride a motorcycle on my own, thank you very much. It finally dawned on me, I do not have to wait for a partner, a man in my case, to make my life whole and start living my life. I can start any time. Yes, I do, you can start any time. So, then the next life-changing decision I made, I was gonna go on a big motorcycle trip. And yes, I did wear those awful blue glasses, but I thought I was cool, and they kept out the bugs. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I took a one-month trip. I drove from Western Canada down to Arizona and back again on my own. And my parents did not sleep for a month. <laughs> Every day I had to phone my parents and say, yes, I'm here, I have not been killed by a mass murderer in the US. <laughs> I'm still good. Um, and I, I just, it, it, anybody ride a motorcycle? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Riding a motorcycle is like absolutely nothing on earth because that trip for me, I was absolutely exhilarated and scared shitless the whole time. <laughs> because you are so vulnerable. Like there's, you, you just, there's nothing protecting you. And you're riding along and you feel every road change and you feel every temperature change and a bug hits you in the face and it feels like a baseball. Um, and you know, sometimes the bike is vibrating so much you feel like your teeth are gonna come out and then your arms are kinda locked in this position, your legs are like this and your hip starts to hurt. And, and then there are times when you're riding and you feel like you're one with the bike and it's just nothing like it. You're just, it's, it's, I can't even describe it. It's just amazing. But what was even more amazing was the responses of people when I got off the bike and they realized I was a woman. Like, hmm? Men and women alike, hmm? They kind of, and then sort of, wow. And then some of them would come up to me and they'd say, well, where are your buddies? I said, I don't have any buddies. What? It's just you? Yeah. Where are you from? Can Canada? You're from Canada? And you're down here? Uh, yeah. So I got this sort of an admiration and I thought, you know what? These folks are seeing me for more than I was seeing myself. Like I was way more than that history that I'd made up in my head, for sure. So I realized that they were seeing me differently and I'd been stuck on one setting. 
You know when you look through a kaleidoscope and you see a picture, and then you shift it slightly and you see another one? Shift it slightly and you see another one? Well, that's what these mandalas represent. And I'd been stuck on one setting, and by the way, it wasn't as nice as one of these mandalas. It was a pretty shitty picture, actually. <laughs> it's just like... And I'd been stuck, and I, I thought, you know, actually, uh, there's more to me than this kind of story that I made up. The meaning that we attach to our histories is written in chalk, not ink. Let's say that again. The meaning that we attach to our past, our history, is written in chalk, not ink. We can change it at any time, and all it takes actually is a slight shift. Just shift it this way, because then I start to zero in on maybe this is what I was doing instead of this. Very powerful, because I realized up until that point, I'd been drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> Seriously, that's what we do. We're hanging on to things, and we're like, well, I have to hang on to this, because if I don't, then that means they're off the hook. Well, they're actually off the hook. <laughs> we're the ones that are on the hook. So I kind of I, I kinda started to get tired of how I was living that way. Um, because it was killing me. I just wanted some peace. And I realized that I had been doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. You know that definition of insanity? That's what I'd been doing. So one of the things that I learned was that forgiveness can transform relationships and it can change patterns. It can break cycles. I grew up in a religious family and I'd been taught to forgive, like the Christian ideal of forgiving. I was the kind of kid that said, you tell me to do this, I'm going to do the complete opposite. So I thought it was just nonsense. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I need to kind of return back to some of my roots here and learn about forgiveness. There was one person in my life in particular who I, I could not forget over. The, I could not forgive this person. This person had been so... Oof, to me, very important person in my life. So I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let this go a little bit. I'm just going to let this go and see what happens. And what was interesting is that over time, I, I forgave this person for this event. And then I forgave this person for this event. And I forgave this person for this event. And as I did that, I started to suffer less. And the relationship started to transform. That person never changed but I did, and therefore I changed the relationship with them. So forgiveness allows us to remember our past in a different way. You know that thing about forgive and forget? That's, I, that to me is nonsense. What it is, what forgiveness does, is it allows us to remember in a different way that empowers us. And along with that, I realized that life is not fair. I was hanging on to a lot of things because they weren't fair. It's not fair that I have to work my butt off and go into student debt up to my eyeballs while I'm doing this bloody PhD, and you next door have a rich family paying for it. That is not fair. My parents were poor. I was poor. You get it, right? That is not fair. Well, you know what? Actually, Life isn't fair. And fairness to me, accepting unfairness became to me like forgiveness. The more I accepted that life was not fair, the less I suffered. And you know what else started to happen? I started to realize that it was in life's unfairness and messiness that I found my true path. Because whenever there was something unfair that happened, I actually did some really interesting things. But I didn't, re I didn't focus on that. I focused on the unfairness and kept festering, because that's what I did. So what it was, what forgiveness is, and kind of understanding life is unfair, is that we're peeling back the layers of the onion. So I realized I'd been carrying around a couple of very contradictory beliefs. One was that at 36, then 38 by the time, whatever, I, I was a failure because I had not got married, I did not have children. 
And that was, I was waiting for that to happen before my life would begin because 99.9% .9 of the people I knew were married and had children. So who was I if I didn't have that? But underneath that, I actually was not relationship material. <laughs> I actually didn't like that. So I had this sort of internal dissonance stewing around in me which was sort of reflected out there. And when I finally started to forgive, because I forgave this one important person, but then I started to forgive all those men in my past who'd been such miserable SOBs, and started to realize that actually maybe some of them had actually done me a huge favor. Because maybe they sensed in me that I was not quite there, that I actually really liked being single. So it was tears of relief. I finally felt like, yes, I can be me. I'm embracing myself. And I, I, what I had done prior to that, and I think we all do, when you get hurt, you armor up. You armor up. And um, you can armor up in all kinds of different ways. My favorite way to armor up was to be cynical, pessimistic, jaded, hugely jaded about my life and the world and all that kind of stuff. And I, real, I thought it was keeping me safe, and it was actually keeping me trapped, because I was disconnected from others, and I was disconnected from myself. And so life is unmessy and full of pain. We can't know light without dark. When I finally came to that understanding, I could let down the armor. And that allowed me to feel compassion. When we are angry at somebody or we carry vengeance, we are bound, an emotional bound, that is stronger than steel. So no wonder we fester. The only way we transform that is through compassion. And that is to, you can't hold anger and compassion at the same time. So that's what we need. And yes, compassion towards those evil enemies of ours. So when I finally started having compassion for the bosses and the boyfriends and the other important people, I actually started to feel a bit more compassion for myself. And that comes to transforming our stories. So instead of why me, it became what might be transformed in me? Like, what, this story that I've been spinning around, because I actually grew up, I grew up in a kind of a tough environment. There were a lot of kind of shitty things that happened to me in my life. And, um, but they happened way back here. Like they were here. And then the story I was telling was here 20 years later. And it was this story that had a hold on me. Not that. That was over. It was this story. And this story may or may not have had anything to do with that. Because you know what we do when we tell stories? We embellish. If I come home and I've had a really whatever kind of day and I say to my husband, did you know blah, 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 blah. And if I don't get the right response from him, I might leave out a detail. I might embellish this one. And before you know it, I've actually spun a little bit of a tale <laughs> that maybe isn't that accurate anymore. So 20 years later, I'm spinning a story that, I mean, there might be some elements that are in truth, but maybe not so much. So our stories, folks, have a hold on us, and we need to get over them. This is a picture of my family farm. When I was growing up there, I hated it. Just hated it. I felt so trapped on that farm, and I, I just hated everything about it. Didn't like my parents either, I'll be honest. It's just like, don't like, I, my brothers just whatever. And uh, I actually thought I was adopted. Because I thought, you know what, I don't have anything in common with these people. Like, who are these people? They're aliens. And somewhere along the line, I had internalized that farmers are dumb. I don't know where. I probably got called that, like, probably, because that's, kids do that, right? Kids say things like that. And that we were very poor. And so I was doing everything I possibly could to prove to everybody that I was not a dumb, poor farmer. <laughs> and then at 36, I ended up being certainly poor. <laughs> And I might have had an education, but when it came to life, I was pretty dumb. Uh, and I realized that actually I, was, I, went to I went to university to try and escape my past. I wanted to go as far away from it as I possibly could. 
But I actually didn't belong in the academic world either. So I was in this nowhere place to be because I was pretending to be somebody else because I talked to people at university and, oh yes, my parents are profs. And I'm like, just change the subject because my parents are farmers, <laughs> not profs. And so I finally came to a realization that I need to own who I am. And when I did that and I sort of shifted the kaleidoscope a little bit more, I realized that my fierce independence and my freedom, my love of freedom and independence came from my parents. That's what I had on the farm. I had huge freedom and independence. There was all kinds of things there. Um, my parents were entrepreneurial, which is what I had become. I was like, that's where it comes from. Like, this, this is it. So I finally kind of made my peace with my past, and when I did, I, I realized that I actually, I now call myself a pracademic <laughs> because um, that's what I am. I, I, I'm educated, I kind of like all that theory stuff, and you cannot get the farmer out of me. I might have left the farm, but I'm a farm girl, and you can't get it out of me. So now I actually make my living, and that's what people appreciate about me. So we always have that opportunity to shift the meaning that we attach to our histories. So this is my husband. <laughs> A month after I went on that motorcycle trip, I met him. Just when I finally kind of got comfortable in my own skin about who I was and I owned all aspects of it and I started to live my life and love my single life, I met him. <laughs> Go figure, WTF, after 38 or 9 years by this point of pure hell and suffering, when I could have actually been fully enjoying my single life, oh no, anyway, I knew he was the guy for me when he got on the back of the motorcycle, and we took a one-week trip. Yes, we did. And um, we'd pull up at gas stations. We were driving between B B from Victoria to Calgary. So folks, we went through redneck country, and I can say that because I too am a redneck. There is a redneck in me. But anyway, we'd get off at these gas stations and these tough guys would come up to Dave. They'd go, you letting her ride that bike? <laughs> and he, you gotta know, Dave is wearing a kilt because he was living in Scotland at the time. He's a Brit. So in his, in his English accent said, you know, I can't do his English accent. I'm not letting her do anything. This is her bike. She's got the license. I don't even know how to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> and these guys would go like this off to their trucks. Like that. <laughs> so folks, we can shift the meaning of our history at any time. And we need to start viewing our past and our histories with kind sight. Not hindsight, with kind sight. Because that's where things are. So that's my, that's my question for you, or my pondering for you today is, what is it from your past or your history that you may, might not be owning? Are you, what can you, how can you shift that kaleidoscope slightly? Take a slightly different view, interpret it differently, find your true, your true voice, your true passion. And if that doesn't work, just ditch the university degrees, buy a motorcycle, and start driving. Thank you.